Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season here today with Lisa and Venkat. Hey Venkat, how's it going? Hey Lisa. Hey. Everything's good here. So what yeah. are we talking about today? Uh, today we're talking about W for Worlds. Uh, All right. What's so going w on in the for... world over where you are, Venkat? The world where I am. Isn't it the same world where we all are? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, but like the weather where you are is different, right? Like being in w. Yeah, but it's not a whole world. But I guess you could say there's a world according to California. Mm. Uh, the weather is actually pretty decent. Uh, forest fire season is starting up and uh, air quality will go down as forest fires go up. Uh, other than that, yeah, I'm getting my second vaccine shot on Friday. And two weeks after that, I look forward to getting back to life. Where are you going to go out in the world once you have your vaccine, Venkat? Ooh, well, we are overdue for a vacation, but that might be hard because of the cat. But uh, I have to visit my parents. It's been a while. And uh, yeah, India is uh, going through like a huge spike right now. So we'll see how that goes and when I'll actually be able to travel. I think there's actually a travel ban right now. But yeah. Yeah. That's on the cards and maybe a vacation. What about you? Uh, well, I, I, my second vaccine, I, I hit the two week mark on Sunday and my life is going, uh, has not changed at all. Um, I have a plan to go to Miami in early June for a huge Bitcoin conference, which is going to happen. Um, but other than that, I don't know. There's another Bitcoin thing in September in London that I might be going to, but. That sounds boring and professional, but uh, so no vacations and stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. huh, Bitcoin conference. Oh, speaking of that, uh, that's been doing well lately, Ethereum especially. Yeah, Ethereum. Went over three k. Yeah. Fifty percent in the last what three weeks. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, uh, speaking of uh, Bitcoin, like uh, you've seen, like how like Bitcoin maximalists kind of view the whole world through the lens of Bitcoin, right? And I've been making the joke recently, like um, they respond to everything with Bitcoin solves that. And they mean it unironically. And I've been using it as a joke about random shit. So I was thinking about uh, a worldview is one where if you look through that lens, the whole world will appear to make sense through that lens. And you'll be sort of tempted to say X solves that. And I was making a joke about another maximalist, which is Stephen Wolfram on Twitter a couple of days back where he's like cellular automata solve this or hypergraphs solve this. And he just published an essay that's a follow-up to his last year's essay that we talked about last year on G, I think G for graphs. Yeah. And um, that's, he claim, he continues to claim to have solved physics, right? I, I yeah. Solve that. yeah. So what do you think of this claim, Venka? Do you think he's, do you think he's onto something or do you think he's like a completely like off on, do you think he's like bluffing? I think he's onto something, but not onto the thing he thinks he's onto. Oh, like he know. doesn't have a theory of everything. He has a, he's created a very interesting sort of mathematical map that sort of rhymes with the world in parts, but he fundamentally kind of has like a wrongheaded understanding of what science is, which is kind of like an audacious criticism for me as a nobody to make of like a renowned physicist. But I'll, I'll, we should link to this. There's a great criticism by Cosmo Shalizi, which um, uh, I found on Twitter about why fundamentally he gets it wrong. Like an example there is, he thinks if a cellular automaton produces patterns that look like the evolution of spots on a leopard, somehow mm. he's explained the biology of leopards getting spots, which is a fundamental misunderstanding of what biology is and what biological it doesn't evolution. Have, that has really strong... Um, Turing was one of the first ones to put out. Yeah, yeah. So, so that comes up and uh, he doesn't acknowledge that, I think. But yeah, morphogenesis. And that's actually been proved mm -hmm. in, um, um, this was, this is interesting in the Cosma Shalizi article that I mentioned, which I'll uh, pass the link on to you. Shali this He wrote this in 2004, I think, when Wolfram had just written A New Kind of Science. And um, at that time, no actual examples of Turing's mor morphogenesis Idea had been found. was proved correct. But examples, actual biological examples in living cells were not found until fairly recently. And yeah, somebody pointed the, Shalizi to that. But the, the point time. is, uh, Wolfram thinks that uh, things that 
reproduce qualitative features of the world since we're talking about world. So he's created a world that emerges out of cellular automata or hypergraphs or whatever it is. He simulates worlds that come out of that and parts of it looks like parts of our world. And he thinks that's somehow a substitute for actually doing science in the traditional way. And I think while that's very interesting, it's not a new kind of science. It's a new kind of something else. It's like, you know, a kind of simulated uh, world I, building. I think, yeah, but I don't think he's saying that he can re replace it. I think he's saying that it's a really high- Oh yes, he absolutely does. He's been saying it for 30 years, but he's like got this whole arrogant spiel of the old kind of science is gone. Everybody will in the future will do this in the future. That's why I kind of compare him to Bitcoin maximalists. Like Bitcoin maximalists, you give them any problem like with the financial world or debt or politics, and they'll be like, Bitcoin solves that. Wolfram is like that. He's like, sell you yeah, know what I'm going to solve this. that. Yeah, <laughs> I've solved that. Um, I so I have to say, like, just to like kind of let my biases out here for the the viewer um, who isn't Van Cat, um, Lisa thinks that Wolfram is one hundred percent correct, and that he has, in, in fact, solved the fundamental theory of everything with hypergraphs. Um, I'm, and just I'm for completeness, confused. are you a Bitcoin maximalist? Are you? Do you think Bitcoin solves X where X is anything? No. <laughs> okay. No, but I think that Wolfgram's hypergraph like tooling and way of thinking about things that he's like, constructed is incredibly powerful and is as powerful or more powerful than he says it is. And that his claims about this applicability and ways of giving new insights into uh, ex existing fields is in fact like incredibly true and will only continue to be prove itself to be like um, more true as time goes on. Um, okay, so since time has gone on, we read his first essay last year, both of us did, and we talked about it on the G episode. Now, a year later, he's posted an update essay claiming to have made more progress. Yeah. I, for one, couldn't actually put my finger on what that progress he was claiming is. So uh, can you give us like your sense of like how far he's come in a year? What's, what's new? Yeah, so I'm gonna struggle with this question because I don't remember what, so giving a <laughs> progress update means like understanding what the diff is, like what the difference is between what he said yeah. last time and what Like what can the theory time. do that it couldn't do before? What can it prove? What yeah, false so example? I think that they've, my understanding is they've built up better tools for running simulations and they've run more simulations and they've been able to um, look into a bunch of different and interesting kind of um, Kind of like different ways of understanding existing problems. I, I want to say there's like an example of like some Fermi Dirac equation yeah. that he was able to look at and like basically model using his explain using his model. Um, so basically this update is like here's a bunch of things that we're now able to explain using our model, which I think so I want to I want to tie this into your refactor camp project. I don't know if this is exactly what you were intending to do with refactor camp, but I think what Stephen Wolfram is currently doing with his model is like war factor camp on steroids because he's taking a new way of looking at the world and a new tool for understanding kind of how physical phenomena, not even physical phenomena, I feel like he said there were other things. So, oh, oh, this also ties into our complexity thing. Sorry, okay, I'll finish the refactor <laughs> camp thought. The refactor camp thought is that he is like, basically what he's doing right now, and this is what the progress, the progress report is, is here's all the like existing phenomena that I've refactored to be able to look at differently using the system that I've developed. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of his like... Um... Oh, and that I totally give him credit for. It is a new way of looking at those traditional things. And, uh, and some the criticism made about it, like, and, and this has been made for 30 years, is that he doesn't give enough credit to like people who thought those things before him. I and think. the part that... It, like uh, Cosma Shalise's essay uses the usual criticism of there's much there's, uh, that's good and new about it, but the part that's good is not new and the part that's new is not good. And that criticism actually lands very well with a lot of what Wolfram has done. But yeah, I totally agree that he's, you should get a lot of credit for uh, uh, refactoring uh, uh, sort of how we look at all of reality, not just computer science or simulations, but all of reality. But th this is actually interesting because I think you also like Scott Aronson, right? The guy who writes about quantum mechanics and stuff. I haven't so, read a bunch of his stuff, but I'm a fan of his, yeah. Okay, so David Deutsch, Scott Aronson, Stephen Waltram, they're all kind of in what I'd consider this sort of slightly heterodox approach of like uh, digital physics as it's called. And there are a lot of people who've come before, like dozens of people who've thought like this. But uh, Scott Aronson actually proved um, that uh, 
a new kind of science. The models in new kind of science could not actually like reconcile quantum mechanics and gravity. And he made like some technical criticisms that uh, were never actually addressed. So I suspect that sort of thing will happen again. A few people will in a few years take this sort of um, hypergraph stuff seriously enough to poke at. And they'll conclude that while it does a lot of interesting things, it doesn't actually solve the fundamental problems that physicists today still consider fundamental problems, which is, for example, reconciling gravity and quantum mechanics or general relativity. No, I think it's going to reconcile gravity. You and think quantum it is? Mechanics. Okay. I think you're wrong, Venkat. Sorry. <laughs> what else? Like, what else is it not going to solve? But I think it does. I really do think it does. Um, okay. So. Uh, but there's a difference between you and me speculating it, that it does and sort of the physics community accepting it. So I think this That's is actually true. a good subject for a long bet. I think we made one earlier this season. So long bet, 10 years, you think hypergraphs or whatever period you pick, do you think uh, hypergraph models will have reconciled uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics? Yes, 100%. In 10 years? Yeah, I think he's already done it. Okay. Not already done we'll it. We'll it's, check again like, in 10 years, but I'm 100% sure it won't be. Somebody else may solve it in a different way. I'm not betting on that, but I'm betting that hypergraphs won't prove to be uh, an explanation for uh, general relativity and uh, quantum mechanics reconciliation. All right, so we, we have a long yeah. bet about Stephen Waltram's world. Uh, uh, but I want to try and generalize uh, since the topic is worlds and Waltram's worlds are just one kind of world. Okay, that's a tongue twister, hard to say. Mm -hmm. So Wolfram's world are one kind of world, uh, but he's, he's sort of a hypergraph or cellular automaton maximalist. He thinks one way of looking at the world, whether it's a refactored way or not, one particular way of looking at the world explains the whole world. So that I think of as a hedgehog mentality. And I think fundamentally my difference is with- But it does, with, Venkat. It's a yeah. fundamental theory. That's why I made it a long bet. So we don't have to argue about it now. In 10 years, we'll decide who's right. But okay, I think my fundamental bias is that though the world may be a consistent place and there may be sort of an elusive unified explanation of everything, I don't think the human mind can actually grasp it. So I think mm -hmm. all our models are fundamentally going to be limited and there's going to only be multiple models. Okay, no, okay. This is the other point I wanted to bring up, but I forgot about when I was talking about refactor <laughs> okay. camp. This is the second point I wanted to make because it relates to something we talked about earlier, which is complexity. Um, we talked about N versus NP or P versus NP a few episodes ago. Um, he makes a really interesting point about like what kinds of problems like hypergraphs are good for, so to speak. And that has to do with, um, basically he's like, there are, so there are problems that like, uh, or NP, MP is it MP yeah. is the one that's like non-polynomial? Yeah, the hard one, yeah. Yeah, so non-polynomial problems are ones that will always be, will never be able to solve. We'll always be coming up with heuristic and algorithms. Like this is exactly the conversation we have. We'll always be having, yeah, yeah. Um, there will always be like heuristics or context that we need in order to create shortcuts that we'll be able to figure out the like NP problems in P time, so to speak, right? Um, um, he was saying that hypergraphs are basically a good way of modeling these like NP complete like problems, but that it doesn't doesn't matter how good the problem is, we're never going to be able to solve NP problems at their base. And okay, so, so yes, there will always be problems outside of our ability to solve them because there will always exist NP problems. So I think we're confusing two different things here. So I'm mainly talking about sort of appreciate what I think of as appreciative explanation, like a single unified mental model that gives you a satisfying explanation of the world, whether or not you can do computations about that world or like tractable polynomial time algorithms about the world, it still gives you a single satisfying way of looking at the world that you think is true, whether or not you can calculate, right? And then when you have to actually calculate something, maybe you have to make approximations, local heuristics and do things like that. So that I think we all agree. Uh, and Walter, I think when I listened to his talk like 25 years ago, yeah, somebody actually asked him that question and he said, yeah, yeah, P equal to NP, he doesn't solve that and blah, blah, blah. But that's, I'm saying, I think something stronger, which is we cannot even come up with a single satisfying model that allows us to understand everything within the same framework. So for example, if you want to understand, we were just talking about two, right? Uh, general relativity gives you like half the answer and quantum mechanics gives you the other half of the answer. But so far, nobody has been able to come up with a model that allows you to use both at once. 
And I think generalizing that, it, it's kind of similar. Like if you look out at the universe and you ask how many ways do I need to view the world in order to have like complete coverage, I think the answer is never one. In my case, I think it's maybe a thousand. But It's so funny that you bring this up because I think Wolfram covers this, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and so like one of the fundamentals, so uh, Wolfram basically says that there's three different like ways that, of worlds that we live in. One of them is kind of like the physical world. It's got matter, it's got gravitation, it's got um, whatever, that's one hypergraph. And that's like the world of matter and existence and things. There's a second um, layer kind of behind that or sort of like attached to it that um, I've sort of long thought that it's kind of where dark matter lives, but he calls it the branchial system and that's quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is the branchial system. And that's all these, like, that's the double slit experiment. That's the multiverse uh, that exists all at once exists the branchial system. It doesn't exist in kind of like, I don't know what is like world word for the first world is, but. Um, it's the multiverse. It's the David Deutsch stuff that you love. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's a third world that he brings up and he calls that the rural system. And that is like, what is the set of rules that the hypergraph uses for every state advancement, right? Like, what are what's the set of rules? Are they interchangeable? Are they the same? And I think this is kind of what you're talking about, about viewpoints, right? It's what rule system are you using to apply to the world? Like, what is the rule set that you're using to, to apply to how the automata moves at like a very small level, right? Um, so like when you have different worldviews or like different changes, like it's, it's very useful to be able to diff use different rule sets to apply, to look at the same, um, like substrate of graph co configuration. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one of the big questions, oh, th this is like, I guess, kind of one of the things he was getting at his post. And it's like, it was one of the big questions that was from last year. And this year he's like, I think I have an answer. The question was, does it matter what the rule set is? are there like what changes about the graphs depending on the rule set? And he was saying that there are universal truths that you can like kind of or universals that you can pull out that make it such that the, the rule set doesn't matter. You get the same outcome no matter what rule set you use. Um, anyways, I thought it was really interesting that so, hmm, yeah, he's got these three different it's, layers of things. It's kind of funny that you use the phrase Wolfram solves this or something like that. It's like Bitcoin solves this. So you really are a Wolfram maximalist over here. Yeah, uh, yeah, 100%. So uh, see, the, this is where I think uh, uh, we disagree because I think um, rule sets and models are not the same thing. But setting that aside for now, uh, again, the whole problem comes up of uh, the part that's new is not good and the part that's good that is not new. Like the idea that there are different rule sets that uh, are sort of equivalent um, for the sort of constants of the universe. That again is like, it goes back to like Newton and stuff. Or, uh, like that's why symmetry principles, every physics law can be stated as a symmetry principle or as like, you know, a principle in time or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself is sort of a trivial thought in the history of physics. Like it's, it's how physics works. You come up with equivalent ways of saying the same thing and different rules kind of like uh, express the same uh, behavior. And they're like formally equivalent to each other, not just analogy. So I don't think that's saying a whole lot. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I don't think we'll be able to settle this philosophical debate here because like uh, a more sort of deeper going physicist discussing it but I don't think he's uh, done as much as he claims. But that said, I think he's done very interesting things. But like, okay, but the whole like, uh, okay, fine, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on from Wolfram though, because I don't think we'll get anywhere with him. I disagree. Him. There was a point, there was another point I wanted to make that went off in a different direction and I can't remember what it is now. What did, what did you just say about like the different world something? Anyways, anyways. Yeah. We'll see in 10 years, we'll see whether or not um, it's like a, f a forgotten obscurity or whether it's taken over all physics and solved gravity and quantum mechanics and consciousness and space and time. He, he made that, see, this is the reason I get so skeptical because when I heard his talk like 20 years ago with a new kind of science, he made the exact same claims for that theory. And now he said that aside for hypergraph, like somebody asked him, what about time? And he said, yeah, yeah, time come, pops out of this naturally. This explains time. What about consciousness? Oh yeah, yeah, this solves consciousness. Somebody else will go look at that um, and sort of figure out the details. And nothing actually happened. And now 20 years later, he's making the same claims about this 
new construct that's hypergraphs instead of uh, 1D finite automaton. So there's a cry wolf pattern here. Like mm -hmm. he does interesting things, sort of uh, overstates claims about them, and then it kind of doesn't pan out. I think and then he sues that. everybody who disagrees with him. That's another thing that's a red flag. Okay, but but it does agree with my theory. Therefore, it's correct. <laughs> like, I think the fact that we were able to like independently come to the same conclusion means a lot of something, right? Like, I so don't we're think the so. Reality here, then, Kat. No, I, I think I think crackpots tend to converge, and you're sort of a crackpot in the best sense of the word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ben Cat. That's very flattering. Yeah. Um, like, uh, <laughs> although the thing I wanted to point out though is that, like, I don't know. I mean, this is like rule set. This like different application of rule sets, and like, I feel like you're kind of waving away the physics, like the fact that you can have two different formalisms that like are the same as being like you kind of like like brushing it off is like not as important as I think it's like very important because I mean I think you can do the same thing with philosophy. I had a series of tweets at some point in the last year or two about how like the work of philosophy is really like I mean everyone who has like a philosophy basically like they can all they, you can make you can take all the different philo philosophical systems and reconcile them because all of them are describing the same like system underneath right yeah that's um, that's a that's one tendency in philosophy and that's actually something somebody said like in his essay Wolfram says something like um, Wolfram actually here's one way uh, I would assess him Wolfram thinks he's taking subjects away from physics uh, philosophy and putting them in physics and solving them as physics problems and I think his most cogent critics convincingly claim that he's actually doing the opposite he's creating a new philosophy of physics and in 10 years I think somebody actually said this in the Twitter conversation in 10 years he may be remembered more for uh, as a philosopher of science than as a scientist. Like that I would grant that oh, okay. everything he's done in 30 years, um, not just his physics, cellular automata and hypergraphs, but also Mathematica, the uh, idea of using software to do math and so forth. He's um, come mm. up with, I think a fundamentally new philosophy of science, but I don't think he's come up with new science. And there it's not, I'm not waving it away. I'm saying that uh, the traditional standards of science that you make uh, predictions and they come true and then you s reconcile problems that have not been solved by the previous paradigm. He's not done that yet. Like he has not yet done a single thing that would, um, that resolves a problem that uh, traditional physics has not. So if all he's done is give you a satisfying new philosophy of looking at everything that's already known, then he's a philosopher of science, not a, philo a physicist. And this is like in relation to his big claims of having explained everything yeah, in a smaller scale. Of course, he's a famous physicist who has like small specific results to his credit. Like people credit him for that all the time. Like he's written several important papers that traditional physicists recognize. They're just not um, a grand unified theories. I see. Uh, Maybe but, a, okay. but, I mean, can you get a grand unified theory without philosophy? I mean, the two are different problems. You need both. Like you need a grand unified theory and you need a philosophy to understand what it means, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's what happened. Like the last good attempt was Einstein, general relativity and quantum mechanics at the same time. And a lot of people came up with philosophies about that. Not very satisfying, but they did. But, I mean, uh, I'm laughing because like, you know, my whole like, my whole like, the Center for Quantum Rhetoric like project is a philosophical project. And this whole like, the whole like idea behind it is that we can create a new philosophy based on like, I put it in like quantum results, but I think that using the model that Wolfram has come up with, I mean, he explains, he has quantum stuff is inside of it, but um, I think that, I think that there is a lot there that like, you can create a like model of consciousness and a philosophy for existence that is strongly based in the reality that we live in. Um, yeah. but I mean, all of them are, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sort of, uh, reacting one way or other to that claim. Like either you or Wolfram or both might come up with very satisfying philosophies that are satisfying both to you and a bunch of other people. But that's not the same thing as what he's claiming, which is a grand unified physics, which are, to me is a whole different thing. It's like ah. uh, he's created a great map. You've created a great map, but that's not the same as the world the map describes. And that's the fundamental thing people argue with him about. Like he thinks he's uh, the map is the territory in a very sort of not in a trivial sense. He literally thinks the world is a simulation, right? So it's a virtual simulation argument. He thinks the world is a hypergraph um, computation. Mm. 
but, it's not that it's described by a hypergraph computation. It is a hypergraph computation, hypergraph right? Computation. So that's but what he claims. It is a hypergraph I, computation, Venkat. Yes, and he's not proved that. And I think you're but giving it is. him... Don't I don't you just know it? It is. It I don't think is. he's proved. Um, <laughs> but here's right. the, like... Mm. Yeah, I mean, okay, but the thing about having a better map is that it'll tell you where the treasure is, right? So yeah, if he actually makes predictions that come out, so he claims he has, he claims that we may not be able to do the experiments, but that he makes new prediction. All right, I'm willing to wait for that for as long as I'm alive. And it could be that in 10, 20, 30 years, there will be an experimental result that only hypergraph theory explains. And then we will all agree that, you know, the world is a hypergraph simulation. It's not just described by one but it, we don't have to agree about it or not venkat it obviously is okay then you're then it's a philosophy then it's a philosophy where you and i if we are if we can disagree and it doesn't mean anything that we disagree then we are doing philosophy not science mm. right i mean I if we disagree and one of us comes out to be right or right or wrong then i don't know that's if that's it. true though i think that i think that you i mean but this goes back to the rule you'll set thing right we can apply different rules and end up at like different results and still live in the same we can still exist in the same universe different worlds same universe using that's why predictions set. are the only way so we are both making predictions about whether in 10 years a certain thing will happen and we'll oh, see if it happens all right I see. All right, anything else about worlds? I think we spent the whole time talking about Wolfram. I think we spent the whole time talking about Wolfram's worlds. Um, this is uh, as always a pleasure, Venkat, and I will see you, <laughs> I guess, uh, see you next week. All right, X, Y, Z, three more episodes to go. Yeah, bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.